valuable to us because it lets us know, yeah, how we're doing. But I think most importantly, what are the new topics you want to see? What's a, an, an upcoming webinar? So a little bit about Techstar. Uh, we're a premier training and a services, a professional services firm. So many customers engage us. Uh, it it may, may not be a formal class in, in, the, in the classical sense, but, um, but more of a workshop, right? So sometimes we provision virtual desktops for, our, for the students, the attendees, uh, or very appropriate for something like an uh, Azure governance workshop, we just roll up our sleeves with the client and say, okay, here's where you're at, where we understand you're at, and here's where we want to go. So let us walk you through that prescriptive uh, guidance. So, um, so making the decisions on, on what needs to be applied for, for governance, and then applying that and then showing you ways that you can continually control that and monitor that long term. Uh, that's where our clients engage us. So you're getting a piece of that today. Uh, no strings attached, uh, no cost today. I think you'll find it very valuable. But again, back to the survey, uh, that's where we find out what's relevant for, for, the, uh, for the public, for the IT professional. Uh, and, we'll, and we can we keep uh, uh, adjusting our schedule. So right now we have uh, webinar scheduled through the end of October. So we'll make sure everyone gets a link. I can pop a link into the window here at the end. Um, so uh, I mentioned we're a premier partner for Microsoft. They come to us very often uh, for, uh, for their clients. But uh, I, I want to talk about premier because I want to introduce Mike O'Neill. So Mike is the star of our show. Um, he's a great technical resource for us and for our clients. Um, he is a certified trainer. Uh, he's got about 20 years uh, career at Microsoft, uh, where he spent a lot of time leading sessions like this. Uh, as a matter of fact, they have crowned him a rock star. So you're in the midst of greatness today. Uh, but, uh, but um, you know, everything from the formal training sessions that I described, but most importantly, those workshops where it's tailored for our clients. That's the end of my little speech. I'll turn it over to Mike. And uh, again, thank you all for attending today. Uh, I've got my own hype man. I think that's awesome. <laughs> thank you, Bob. Uh, Bob is our Microsoft practice leader, though. So he runs the whole show. And uh, as Bob mentioned, I was at Microsoft for uh, 18, almost 19 years uh, before I finally retired and then got bored of retirement. And I've come to Techstar and I absolutely love it. It's just a great place to be. So we can do all these technical services. I always say we're the best kept secret because it's 1,500 people around the globe. What you're going to find today is I'm a generalist. I know a little about a lot. So I'm really good at piecing all the stuff together. And then from those 1,500 worldwide resources, we have specialists, specialists on SQL Server, specialists on Azure, specialists on everything. Um, so no matter what you're trying to do in the Microsoft world, we pretty much got you covered. Um, when it comes to Azure, and this is the last of the commercial, but I just want to make sure you realize whether you choose us or whether you choose another partner, it's really good to have a partner be your guide on this. Somebody who's taken the journey multiple times before that's going to show you the safest and, and quickest way to get to where you want to. Because Azure is very, very complex, as you're about to see. Uh, and you can really get messed up on your costs and controlling them and, and whatnot if you don't put some governance in place. It affects security. It affects pretty much everything else. Uh, I have a note down here. You know, Some things that we often take for granted, something as simple as renaming a resource group you would think is just a right click and hit rename, but it doesn't work that way in Azure. Um, you can't rename a resource group. You can only move them around and shuffle them. So uh, I'm trying to teach you today some good governance policies to put in place that will help you uh, control your environments uh, in a huge way. And then I have a note here, Azure is leveraging three updates a day, averaging three updates a day in 2020. These things are coming out so fast. Um, so again, using the partner or at least staying informed on uh, on what uh, is going on. I've got some links in here um, that I'm going to give you. Uh, we'll we'll let you keep abreast of everything that's happening in a very quickly evolving and moving environment. By the way, um, Bob mentioned at the end of today's session, you're going to have a chance to give me some feedback on how I did. I use that all the time to to modify our content. Matter of fact, today you're going to see brand new content. 
Um, our scores have been phenomenal. I don't think we've gotten a single uh, less than than good score yet, uh, but I'm always looking to add new and exciting stuff. So I'm going to send you, if you fill out that eval form, and the eval form I think is seven questions, should take less than two minutes. Um, super simple. And it's just basically, how do you think we did on this and this and this, and do you have any advice? Uh, but anyway, I'm going to send you this deck. And just to show you, this deck is filled with just tons of links and there's all these clicks in here and everything else. And these will all work for you. They're not tied to my account. So when you click on the various demo sections in here, um, you'll be taken right into your Azure portal where all this stuff exists. Uh, plus I have tons of notes. I have sample codes in here. All of this will be yours for the simple price of giving me feedback on my email form. Uh, plus you'll get a recording of today's session. So uh, highly worth your time. As I said, if it takes you more than a couple minutes, something's seriously wrong. Uh, with that in mind, let's dive in. And I'm going to try to do as much demo as possible. I hate PowerPoints, but we do need to discuss uh, a couple of things, kind of set the table. There are a lot of mistakes that are made, common mistakes in Azure. And Microsoft and a number of other people um, uh, basically did some studies, did some reports, and this is what they came up with. Choosing the wrong data store is a huge, huge issue, and it's very easy to overshoot this. You do not need SQL Server for everything. Um, sometimes you could do it with blobs or tables or queues or uh, SharePoint lists or whatever. So people are often uh, adding cost, adding complexity when they don't need to, depending on what they're trying to do. So keep that in mind. Uh, not selecting high availability. Your uh, VMs will at times go down for maintenance or be taken offline or whatever. And if you have some mission critical work that you're doing and you can't be down for, for a couple of hours, then you need to select that high availability option when you create those VMs. It does add a, a small amount of cost, uh, but it will save you a tremendous amount with when indeed you have updates or patches or other things that need to be done. This one is a huge one, oversizing your VMs. Uh, people create virtual machines in Azure and they don't really know and understand how much compute power they need. And they typically will oversize uh, rather significantly the amount of number of cores they need, the amount of memory, the disk space, et cetera. And so you end up paying uh, for a lot of bandwidth that you're not gonna be able to use. We're gonna talk, matter of fact, I told you I added new content. Well, one of the pieces of content I've added is a new dashboard that uses AI and governance together, and it will go out and look at all of your resources and it'll right size them for you and actually save a ton of money and a ton of time uh, by making suggestions using AI. I'll do that toward the end, uh, just before we wrap today, I'll show you that. Uh, and then I'm actually doing a demo of that in our Power BI session this Friday, assuming I can get everything working by then. Uh, but it's very, very cool stuff. Bottlenecks, we talked about orphaned resources. People put stuff out and then they leave the company and they're just sitting out here. But the number one without question is not applying governance. Uh, and if at all possible, day one. Uh, so I'm going to show you how to apply this governance. You don't have to have this done day one, but it just makes your life a whole lot easier. So if you learn today's deal and start using it from this point forward, uh, I think things will work better. Classic example, right? This is a, a network server right here that uh, we used to, to have and they got totally out of control and no one knew what was going on and where things are. Instead, you want governance to apply this, this bottom view, right? Everything's labeled, everything has a purpose, everything's cabled and color organized and you name it. That's what governance does. So the wrong way, if typically you jumped into Azure like most companies did, you just threw out names and you put out uh, very kind of arbitrary listings. And instead, we like to follow a Microsoft methodology, a set of protocols to make sure that we're using names that are very descriptive. So if you look at this, you'll see, uh, you know, Myco VM database one, that doesn't tell me anything. Uh, but if I look down here, I can look at my VM in the financial group for my client with 001 or a virtual network that's out on the West US uh, 
region and the cloud. Uh, all this gives me an idea of exactly what each one of these resources is and does. And our methodology, we typically will use object environment resource client location and number. So it looks like this. The object is a virtual machine. The environment I'm running is my demo environment. This could be a dev environment or production environment or anything else. The resource, this provides SharePoint. It's for us, Techstar. So we always use TS when we it's for us. Uh, when we build these for clients, it would have your client name on it, uh, which location in the cloud it's running. So this is South Central US, and this is the first instance of this particular VM. If I jump over real quick to um, uh, Azure, so let me make sure I got way too many windows open. Here we go. So this is the Azure, and to get to Azure, you're going to type portal.azure.com, just like you type portal.office.com to get to your 365 portal. Portal.azure.com will get you out here to the, the different resources. And there are quite a lot of resources. And you can see listed here, uh, I've, I've mixed some of these badly named ones with some of these uh, uh, correctly named ones. And you could tell it's just much easier to quickly determine this is a resource group for my demo server. It's running a Techstar solution on South Central US version one. And this is the VNet part of this uh, resource group. Um, so very quickly with one look, I can see exactly what this is meant to be and what it's for um, and where I might want to go. And if I look at all my resources, the more you use Azure and the more you have out there, the more convoluted it's going to get. And so I'm going to show you today how we can set up uh, hierarchies, how we can build out resource groups and set things up so they're organized, not only for you to better manage your resources, uh, but also when it comes to things like cost accounting and reporting and um, security, it's much easier to understand the organizational structure if you've applied governance early on. So that's what we're going to be doing out here is we're going to be looking at ways to set up these. We're going to add policies and blueprints. We're going to use RBAC controls. Um, and if you're unfamiliar, if this is relatively new to you, I've got a lot of people on the line and some of you are brand new to Azure and some of you are very advanced. So I'm going to try to give you 10% beginner, a whole lot of intermediate, and another 10% at the end of, of uh, very advanced stuff. So I'm going to try to cater to everyone today. Um, so bear with me as we go through this. But anyway, this will this will let you uh, kind of see that and understand how that works. Let me go back to my slide deck here. So uh, let's move in. When should you govern or when must you govern is probably a better way of doing it. If you have multiple engineering teams, so you're uh, deploying to and operating in various environments with multiple teams, you really have to have governance or it's going to get out of control fast. Um, the other thing is if you have multiple subscriptions, uh, you're going to see that uh, subscriptions are, are a big part of the hierarchy in certain parts of that hierarchy fall under certain subscriptions. I'll show you a graph of that in just a second, um, but it can get really confusing and, and cause issue. Any industry that requires regulatory compliance, cost control, or uh, uh, security for design consistencies, you got to have governance on top of, or again, get out of control. And this last one is really important. Um, you know, my son is a programmer, and uh, uh, we talk about this all the time. This con this fight between operations and DevOps and uh, uh, all the cloud uh, group at your company. You know, they set it up and they want it to look a certain way. Developers want to just get in there, get their servers up, get running, and start coding against it. And there's this constant battle back and forth, and it causes tons and tons of, of problems and issues. Uh, so governance can, can get rid of all of that. We can build it with a one-click approach. So all you do is, is you pop a single button, and you can build out entire environments for dev and test and production uh, all within the confines of what you've set up from a policy standpoint. These next two slides literally are exactly what we're going to cover today, right? And so I've kind of broken it down into what are we trying to do? We're trying to reduce your costs. We want to use automation. We want to create hierarchies, reduce the complexity, and then create these things called blueprints. And that's kind of where we'll end up. Um, but uh, we do this through things like policies. There are a lot of cost-saving measures inside of Microsoft Azure. Believe it or not, Microsoft is going even further to help companies uh, reduce their consumption because uh, they don't want you spending unnecessarily. They want you spending on stuff that, that matters. 
Um, Microsoft, and, and I'm going to pause for a second. I've never talked about this before, but this is a really important point for you to understand. Actually, I, let's make a little contest of this because I'm curious if anyone on the call knows the answer. So use your chat window and let's see if you can give me some feedback. Who do you think Microsoft's biggest competitor in the world is? And I'm not saying just in the cloud, but who is Microsoft's biggest competitor in the entire world? If you consider every corporation in the world, who's the number one competitor to Microsoft? And I'm probably gonna have to flip over to look at your answers. So let's see, or Bob, if you can see the answers. Facebook. Um, Facebook, Facebook, no, good guess. Any other guesses? So a million imaginary points, Alcom, Amazon, Amazon, AWS, Apple. Yeah, I see all those. So no one's got it right yet. And I'll go ahead and tell you the answer. The answer is Microsoft's biggest competitor without question. And remember, this is coming from an 18 year Microsoft veteran. I know this for a fact, it's taught at Microsoft. Microsoft's biggest competitor is Microsoft, right? In order to get you to buy the latest version of a particular product, oftentimes they're selling against their own previous version of that product. They wanted you back in the days when Office had version numbers, right? To get you to move from 2010 to 2013, they were actually selling against themselves. Well, in the cloud, it's the same thing, right? To, to get you to utilize it, to get you to use the latest and greatest features, they want to make sure that your previous consumption of the cloud hasn't been wasted. Because if you look at your reports and you see we spent X amount of dollars and half of that was stuff we never used and whatnot, you're unlikely to stay with Microsoft in the long term. So Microsoft is doing their best to make sure that you consume, but you consume wisely. And we'll talk about that today through some of these automations where they're applying AI, uh, et cetera. We also wanna talk about RBAC, role-based access control. This is how you secure and control all your different sections. We wanna uh, minimize your op operational risk uh, from a security perspective. So we'll be setting up network security groups or NSGs. Um, you can put Azure resource locks on certain things. And then a whole section on reporting, uh, security, Azure billing, rate cards, you name it, it's all part of this whole thing. Uh, so let's dive into this. First and foremost, I, I, I found this slide out on the Microsoft Deck uh, area. And this is supposed to represent the, the services for Microsoft. And what's funny is this is a really old slide uh, because as I said, there's a whole lot to Azure. And when I mean a whole lot to the services, if we click on this, this is actually gonna take me out into the Azure services and we can show you as I, I go in here, all the different categories, but if I say all services, this is actually what this slide should represent. As I scroll down and 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 I keep going and I keep going and you get the point. There's a bazillion parts to Azure now and there's more being added every single day. As I was talking about three updates uh, uh, a day are coming out from the Azure team at Microsoft. So there's a whole lot there. And Microsoft makes it fairly easy through this interface. If I wanna look at my compute options or my networking options or storage options or whatever the case I want, um, I can pick from the groups over here and then it'll show me all the services that I have. At the bottom, they also list different training that's available from Microsoft. We provide training as a, a training partner, um, but you can also get online training from Microsoft. Uh, some of this is their uh, typical Microsoft training. Others are part of their lynda.com, Microsoft acquired lynda.com. It's part of their uh, environment. Um, and you could also get some training from them as well. So those links are built in there. So uh, play around, explore, check out what you want, but there are so many services that that slide that I was showing you obviously was way outdated, right? There's not, a, not enough space in the world to fill all that stuff in here. So there's a whole lot, a lot of moving parts. You wanna make sure you understand it. You wanna make sure you got some control over it. It's only gonna get worse. To get some control, we have to understand the landscape, and that includes what Microsoft calls the hierarchy of objects. It all starts at the highest level, which is what's called a management group. Under the management group, you would have subscriptions. Under the subscriptions, you'd have resources, or resource groups, excuse me, and under the resource groups, then you would have your resources down here. The reason this hierarchy is important is it's all about the scope within uh, Azure. 
So if I want to set security options or permissions or RBAC, you know, roles, um, I need to do it at a particular level. And each one of these levels can maintain um, its own scope within the various resources. Well, what does that mean? Let's say Bob works for me and I want Bob to have the ultimate control. He's my boss. So I can give Bob permission from a management group level and those inherent rights filter down to every other level below. If I have someone else on my team, let's say me, and I'm you know, someone who shouldn't have quite that level of access, I'm not an executive, I'm not in the, the highest ranks, so I may only provide access at a resource group level. So if I gave myself control here, or Bob gave me control here, I would have the ability to access this resource group and all the resources underneath it, but I wouldn't have the ability to access any of these resources or these different subscriptions or the managed group as a whole. So we talk about that in terms of scope and understanding the scope from a hierarchy of objects. You'll see as I'm building policies today, as I'm putting in uh, blueprints and different stuff, it's always the first question it always asks me is, where is the scope? Where's the hierarchy of, of uh, objects that you want to start this at and everything will filter down. When we talk a little more, you'll understand how, well, what happens is Bob gives me permission to this subscription, but under here gives me a do not have access to the SQL, which one overrides the other kind of thing. And you'll learn about how Microsoft uh, uh, puts that together. So when you take a bigger look at this, Microsoft uh, fundamentally has opened up all of Azure with this uh, uh, process for developer access through use of what's called the ARM or the Azure Resource Manager. It's this big block right here. Azure Resource Manager is the portal in which every service, uh, every virtual machine, every everything you'd wanna touch inside the Azure environment actually goes through the ARM for managing. And what's cool about that is Microsoft then allows on the front end to build out all kinds of different clients that can go in and reach into the ARM to control all of these different services down here. You'll notice too, by the way, there's an authentication section out here, so it's all secured. So if I wanna have access into, as I mentioned, uh, a virtual machine, it would go into the ARM, the ARM would say, hey, authenticator, can Mike get to that uh, resource? If the answer is yes, then it would pass me through and I could get into the virtual machine. So the ARM controls everything. What's cool about the ARM is it's completely programmable through a number of resources, the Azure Portal, PowerShell, Azure CLI, REST clients, REST API clients, all the SDKs that Microsoft's published. So what we're showing you is these front end tools now can connect into the ARM and have systematic programmable control over all these back end services. And I'll show you some of that today. As a matter of fact, if I jump out to the uh, Azure portal again, uh, where is my Azure portal? Oh, it's right here. Okay. So I'm in Azure. Um, one of the things you'll notice inside of Azure, if you ever want to get back out to the highest level, I just click on the word Azure and it's taken me back out to the top level. The top level, I have my services and of course my most recently used uh, resources are listed here. At the bottom, I can navigate, I can pull up my dashboards, my costs, my tools, different stuff down here. But what's really nice is a, I have a search tool. So if I know, for example, um, that I want to go into my subscriptions, I just start typing. And again, it will filter and pull that information right up. I can see right from inside of there. Notice also that not only did they just give me links, but I have resources. I have the marketplace. We'll talk about that in a minute. And all my documentation related to subscriptions is listed right here as well. Super easy to find and super easy to get into. But what I want to show you is this toolbar right up in here. Most people neglect this or don't realize it's here. And the first thing you'll notice is this cloud shell. If I click on cloud shell, what this is doing is this is opening up a terminal ac uh, application down here at the bottom, um, which has PowerShell currently selected. This allows me to manage all of my Azure with these PowerShell scripts. I can literally just type or what you're gonna see is I can copy and paste from the different portals right into here and have this control. I could set up VMs, I could set up resources, I can anything you can do manually inside the portal, you can do from the PowerShell script. If I don't wanna do PowerShell, I have Bash, so I can flip this over and run it in a Bash, bash 
uh, Cloud Shell. Um, we can use those uh, uh, APIs I was talking about, so REST APIs. Uh, actually, when you run PowerShell, it's going to convert it over into REST APIs through the interpreter before it passes it on. Uh, but the point being is that Microsoft will allow you to use any of those different resources as a way to get in here and programmatically run the resource or the ARM, the Azure Resource Manager, and by extension, then go out and touch each one of those thousands and thousands of services. So basically, they've created an entire macro programmable language um, that's available. By doing that and by applying these REST APIs, it's a, a lot of this is done through the REST APIs, what Microsoft also is able to do is extend this data out in new and interesting ways. So for example, most of, not most, all of Azure here is being run off of Active Directory. Um, so the, the Azure Active Directory services, and they keep track of what's running and which user access and all that different information. Well, if I know these SDKs, if I know how to write into the REST API clients, uh, I can do amazing things like I can query my Azure services to get information back about uh, usage for, uh, you know, which users are using it, how often are they using it, when are they using it. And then once I collect that data, I can then apply that data with the Microsoft API stacks and start looking through it and, and making smart decisions about Am I utilizing all of these resources? Is my server over spec? Do I need to downgrade my server to save costs? Are there times when the server's not being used that I could just shut the server off? Again, because Azure charges by consumption, we can use those API stacks to really efficiently go after this data and make it uh, uh, work best for my organization. I know this is a, a lot of information. I know it's comprehensive, but I just want you to see all the possibilities that are available by applying governance and then using these different uh, developer access into the ARM allows you then to customatically, customatically, I just made that up, <laughs> systematically uh, take advantage of all that. We also should talk about compliance. Uh, as I mentioned, many of you are in industries, finance, healthcare, et cetera, that have compliance issues. It's a lot harder to enforce compliance standards after the fact, but it can be done, and we've done it before. Um, you will have audit failures, though. If, if after the fact of compliance, in other words, you didn't apply governance, you come to Techstar and you say, hey, we want to sit down with you, we want to do a workshop, we want to understand uh, how all this stuff uh, fits together and how we can best organize our environments, we'll help you do that, and we can set up these compliance deals, uh, but they will fail on their first run because you're going to have to stop a lot of these resources, you're going to have to put the compliance in. Better if you can to do it earlier. Uh, but if you can't, we'll retrofit compliance in and we'll do it in the most minimally disrupt, uh, disruptive way humanly possible. So something to keep in mind. I'll show you in the reporting section that we'll get to in just a few minutes where that compliance comes in. Microsoft, uh, when they talk subscriptions, um, understand that, you know, predominantly 90 some odd percent of all the work you're going to do in Azure is going to be based on, on consumption. In other words, you can have as many subscriptions as you want. You can have as many VMs as you want. You can have as many as whatever you want. Um, you're only going to be billed when you consume the services of those. Uh, so for example, if I go back to my Azure and show you all the resources I currently have cooking, um, quite a few, uh, I know it's hard to see. Let me get rid of this down here. So I've got a ton of these out here, demo servers and different machines and different stuff. We don't have our client uh, services on this. We have that under a different uh, domain. So this is more of our demo environment. But there's a lot going on here uh, in this particular environment. And if I went back out and I looked at my cost accounting, for example, um, so I want to go into cost management, you're going to see that my costs are pretty minimal um, I'm currently only spent $63.53 uh, on this particular license. Uh, why is it so cheap with all those services? Because they don't have to run. I'm only going to be charged while those systems are up and running and providing the services to me. If I don't need them, it's a demo machine and I don't need it until the next time I do a demo, I simply just turn it off and I'm not being billed. So you don't have to worry about... Um, you know, uh, uh, building a number of machines because you can keep them in an off state. And we'll even look at some of the, the policy changes 
uh, that are set up that you can actually have your VMs turn themselves off every night at 7 p.m. because you know no one's going to use them overnight, for example, and then turn themselves back off at uh, back on at five o'clock in the morning. All that is part of the cost analysis and and setting up those policies and stuff. Um, so even at an extended forecast right now, if I had everything running nonstop, I would come in about two hundred and eighty-two dollars and fourteen cents per month. Uh, which is pretty cheap considering all the different things I have running and all the systems I have available. I'm going to pause for a second, see if there's any questions. Remember, you can use the chat window. Bob loves to interrupt me, so I want to make sure I'm answering your questions as we go. I think they're all taking their notes. and uh, Okay. Yep. Nope, that happens. No, uh, well, I, I, just so you all know, by the way, I was really worried because we've had classes before and people were like not asking questions, and, not, and that's usually a bad sign. I think, Bob, in both our cases with our previous Azure classes or governance classes, uh, people came back and they were like, I was writing so fast, my mind was filling up with all the possibilities. They just, it wasn't that they weren't paying attention, they were just a little bit overwhelmed. And I know it can be overwhelming, but uh, I got a lot to go through, so I'm going to keep cranking. So you should have multiple subscriptions. You're not going to be billed for them. You should put one definitely for production. Microsoft says have one for dev and test. But the reality is our recommendation is have two, have one for dev and have one for test and then have production. So I guess three overall. Remember, you're not going to get billed unless those are running. Uh, but that's the smart way to do that. And then if you have multiple subscriptions, you need to create a management group. A management group allows you to create this hierarchy that we've been talking about for securities, policies, compliance, et cetera. It's basically a folder. It acts like a giant folder in which everything um, gets put in. So again, we have these naming conventions that we would look at. Let's go show you what a management group looks like. Um, so if I want to go out to management group, uh, manage management groups, there we are. If I could only type. So I can click on this and this will give you an organizational hierarchy. Now you'll notice I have a M development license. This came from uh, the Microsoft Partner Network. We've actually, I think, disabled this one. We're not using it anymore. Um, but I have other licenses as well. And in this case, I've created at the highest level this thing called the Techstar Management Group. This is the root level. So this is what everything falls under. And usually this is the name of your company. So here's my Techstar Management Group. Under that management group, I've created a number of other groups, our accounting team, our HR group. Uh, Bob and I are part of our Microsoft organization, so we're devoted to the, the Microsoft group. We also do um, AWS. We also do Google, so we're partners with all those companies. Uh, but obviously, uh, a, a big chunk of our business, a big chunk of our specialty is in this Microsoft ecosystem. So we have a, a Microsoft group inside here. And under that Microsoft group, I've established this Visual Studio Enterprise license um, that I own. So you can go up and down the hierarchy as you need to. Um, and notice I have the breadcrumbs here, so I can back up a level and go into the HR group and see if there's anything there. Let's say under HR group, uh, we have contractors and employees, so I want to create a brand new group. It's very simple. Right at the top, I just create a new management group. I can use an existing one or create a new one. I'm going to call this contractors, right, and ask me what's the group name to display, um, and I can put in whatever I want to. I'm going to go ahead and click yes, and this will take just a second. You'll see the little blue line appears under the notification. This tells me that it's currently running. This is your hamster wheel. And in just a second, you'll see that a brand new, when it refreshes, you'll see a brand new management group has been added under the HR group, under the Techstar management group that allows me to kind of build out these hierarchies and structures. Uh, that took a long time. There it is. So, so there's my contractor group. And I could keep building out as I need to. Let me go back and show you what it looks like when you get it all kind of put together. So again, at the highest level, you're going to have this root management group. That'll be the name of your company. Then you have multiple groups under that. Notice that subscriptions can reside anywhere except this root management group. They can be under the root management group, or they can be under a subgroup or sub sub subgroup, et cetera. But when you sit down in a workshop or when you plan, this is what you want to kind of organize and think strategically how you want to set this up. In this case, we've done this around departments, which is sometimes uh, the way you want to do it. Uh, but 
uh, oftentimes you may want to do this around functional lines of business or whatever. So it just depends on your organization. We do not always set up management groups based on departments. Um, it just depends on what you're doing. So customers, every customer is different. And we'll, we'll sit with them and, and figure this out. I just gave you a demo. We just added to that. So I'm going to skip ahead. The next thing we want to talk about, which is huge, is resource tags. Resource tags allow you to tag anything. It's basically metadata that you're adding into your um, Azure resources. And the problem is, I apologize, like I'm going to sneeze, which is not good in the middle of a webcast. Okay, sorry for that. I'm glad I hit the mute button on that because that was exciting. Anyway, the, the metadata can be anything you want. It, you're not required to put anything, uh, but it's just like an office document or anything else. People will forget to put any metadata on, and then it's really hard to find stuff later. With Azure, we can actually demand that it has metadata, and we can write policies so that it can inherit metadata uh, from the uh, hierarchy above it. So for example, if it's in a folder, that folder is marked as HR, I can by default automatically meta tag uh, the HR department as, as one of the uh, possible tags. I've listed some out here. This is in no way a complete list. These are just ones we use often. The creator who put it, which department or cost center. You can put budgets in here. So how much budget I have to spend and I can attribute it to certain parts of this. The application, the owner, the role, the project environment, lifespan, et cetera. All this allows you to go in and meta tag anything that you want to. And so what happens, let's show you how we can uh, uh, do this. So I'm going to go back in here. Um, and let me go back out to some of my resources. I'll show you how we can tag a resource. So any one of these resources that I want to, let me go down to some of these that I've created. Uh, so here's a network security group, right? And I can click on this and you're gonna see listed in here, these are all the tags and I can create any tag that I want to, but I've, I've standardized to use group, owner, purpose, availability, and budget. But if I wanted to add a tag or change a tag, it's it's super simple to go in here and and make some changes. So here are my tags, and I'm going to put in uh, uh, a new tag uh, and uh, say a tag is department. Oh, I've already got department in here. Let's do um, uh, let's see timeline. So this is when I think this is going to be done, and I'll put this as October of 21, okay? So I can create any tag that I want and set its value to any value that I want, and I can put it in here, and when I click down, I've automatically created and appended this meta tag. You can only have 20 meta tags attached to any particular resource. That's a lot of meta tags. It'd be great if you had that many. Uh, most people don't, but you can see I added it in. So now I just created a timeline and I've set this to October of 2021. And that's now part of the tagging of this virtual machine network security group. Okay. What's nice about that is when you go into the cost accounting, which I'm doing here, this is the cost analysis that we were showing you earlier, and I can get some detailed breakdown of the service, how much is going to storage, how much my SQL database is costing me, all this good information. But you can go into the groups, for example, and at the very bottom here, I can group by the tag. And it'll pull all the tags that I have and I can go in here, for example, and say, show me this data shown by the owner. And I'm probably the only owner in here, owner and untagged are the only ones in here. But you can see how you can apply the tags in, show me by department, show me by um, anything else that I want. So I can click in here and say, uh, let's look by department. I probably need to add more tags so this looks more interesting. Yeah, right now it's currently almost all Microsoft data, but I could apply this in and you could quickly see from a cost breakdown which license is, is costing me the most, which department, which project, which group, uh, et cetera, just by flipping and allowing you to create these dashboards out however you want to. Tagging is absolutely critical for um, governance. You really, really want to make sure you put these in. You also want to make sure you think through the tags before you get started so that you don't have random tags. If everyone uses a different name for the same tag, uh, it isn't going to help you. Um, so again, workshops will help you kind of standardize that and get everyone on the same page. 
Okay. Wow. My time is whipping by. Um, so that's cost analysis. Let's get into dashboards. Uh, dashboards are even different. Uh, if I click on the dashboards, it'll load up my primary dashboard. These dashboards can be completely customized. Um, so we can come in again and, and sit down with you and help you build out whatever dashboard that you want to. I apologize. My network connection's running really slow, probably because I'm recording and hosting a webinar at the same time I'm doing this. But we'll give that just a second to pop up. So the dashboard will allow you to, to customize any piece of information that you want and build a visual on top of it. And uh, when we do a class, uh, one of the offers we have, we have a workshop where we sit down and we talk to you. The other is we can actually do a class on this and teach your people how to do all of, all of this stuff. So this is a, a typical dashboard, and I've just thrown out some custom controls and let you see this. Uh, but we can create new dashboards. I can go in and edit my existing dashboard. These are all the different types of resources and things that I can put in here. Uh, videos, application summaries, uh, arm actions. You can see all of this stuff. So if I find something that I want, I want to be able to attach to my marketplace. I can literally just pick this up and drag it. And you'll notice that when I drop it somewhere or, or potentially drop it, things move out of the way to make room for it. And you can resize these, you can rescale these, you can do everything else that you want to. And then when I'm done customizing, you'll now see the marketplace is right here. I click on it and it takes me instantly into the marketplace. The marketplace is where Microsoft and other vendors will build out solutions depending on what you want to do. So I know, for example, I want a dev server set up and I want to be running a SQL server, for example. Well, all I have to do is go into the marketplace and I can go into my database, for example, and look, and it's got all kinds of different databases in here, Ubuntu, Centris, I've got uh, MariaDB, I've got whatever. I want to highlight this for SQL Server, so I can just start typing SQL. I hit enter, and it'll filter out all the ones that don't relate to SQL Server. And now it comes back. And then I can click on any one of these and find one. Notice some of these say Microsoft. So this is Microsoft hosted Azure SQL. Um, some of these are by other partners. Cognos has a SQL Server 2016 SP2 web with vulnerability assessment attached to it. And so you can just click into these and it'll tell you exactly what it's about, how much it's going to cost, what their plans are. Um, and if I say create or start with configuration, it'll walk me through a wizard to get all this set up to exactly the specs that I want. Um, let me go back. That's not what I wanted to do. So let me go back to where I was into the marketplace. And what I'll do is I'll just walk through a, a Microsoft one real quick. So I'll do the same thing, SQL, S-E-R-V-E-R. -E Let's pick a Microsoft one. Notice I could filter and say, just show me, for example, the Microsoft solutions, or just show me using this operating system or this pricing or whatever. I just want Azure SQL Server. So I'm gonna click, I'm gonna tell it I wanna create it. Now this isn't a problem, because remember I pay on consumption, not on the creation. So what do you want? You want SQL managed instances, SQL virtual machines, or you want to create a database already out there. Um, and depending on what I want, I can create a single database. I can use elastic pools or servers. I'm going to create a single database. And now it's going to ask me to go through and just fill out this wizard. Here are the tabs. It'll ask me the basics, the networking, additional settings. It always asks for the tags, because remember, we should be meta tagging everything. And I just go through and say, which license do I want to apply this to? Okay, based on the license, which resource group? These are all those resource groups that you just saw under my licenses. So I'm going to put this under my demo TS. And notice I know exactly where it's going. South Central, it's under the demo server. It's for the Techstar group. I can give it a name. I'm not going to do this. I'll just put a name. I can select an existing server that I have. I haven't set one up, so there's not one available. If it doesn't have one, it'll say create new. And now I can go out and I can actually build my server at the same time. And so you confirm all the passwords. It'll ask you how much storage, how much compute capacity, on and on and on. I'm not going to do this for the basis of time, but I just want you to see uh, I can go in here and I can configure my database. I can configure the server. It'll make recommendations. And then once I hit click, it goes and it builds that for me automatically. I don't have to do anything. All right, let's keep going because I'm getting a little behind. 
but very, very powerful stuff. So these dashboards will allow you to look at your consumption and tell exactly how much compute power you're using, how often do they use it, at what time do they use it, who's using it. Um, it basically rolls up every piece of information you could possibly want. And you can even get this in written form. So this is a graphical view, but this is also a table view, which will show you the average uh, uh, IOPS uh, uh, input output running on your machine, how much uh, backup hard disk space have you used, all that kind of stuff. You can get it in tabular form, you can get it in graphical reports as well. So it's very, very cool. Microsoft uses what's called RBAC, uh, role-based access control. And the way this works is you can apply RBAC to users, groups, services, or managed identities. So these are the things that RBAC applies to. And what I do in RBAC is I create a security principle that defines the roles, assignments, and scopes. Scope is what I was talking about. Where is this rule or policy going to be put in place? And it always rolls downhill. So if I put my RBAC on a subscription, it won't affect the management group, but it will affect the resource group and the resources underneath it. So RBAC allows you to fine grain access to all of your different resources under, um, manage, or under Azure. Um, so it lets me set principles and policies for all of this. We'll look at this in just a second. So uh, I talked about this already, but just realize, so RBAC will allow you to go in here into the arm and set privileges that will then allow me to touch each and every one of these different resources. I also have the ability to do what are called ARM templates. So using the Azure Resource Manager, this point, Microsoft has created a bunch of quick start templates. I'm gonna click on this. Remember, you're gonna get this after you, you give me some feedback for today, you're gonna get this deck and all these links will work for you. And if I look down here, there are thousands of these things, uh, 934 at the current moment, quick start templates are currently out in the gallery. And whatever you're trying to do, um, these templates will basically create uh, all of your different resources for you. So I wanna deploy a simple Windows VM or I wanna create a storage account with a blob container on it. Well, rather than me having to figure that out and go through all those different forms and features, instead I can go to one of these templates and if I click on it, it's just gonna go ahead and um, tell me what are the parameters that I wanna put in that relate to my environment. So what's your user admin and password? How do you wanna prefix this? What version of Windows do you wanna use? So I fill out this stuff and it builds these PowerShell or command line scriptlets that I can literally copy and paste. So if I grab this uh, and I can copy and paste into my command shell, and it would build me this uh, environment exactly. So what I'm doing, just so you know, is where it says admin username down here, I would go find that and I'd put in the real name that I wanna use. So I'm gonna change the script with these parameters for what I want. And then once that script set, I can then go ahead and install this automatically using PowerShell. So I punched a button, and again, we'll just let this run, but it's actually gonna go out to my Azure and it's gonna build this for me uh, and set all this stuff into motion. And this gives you more, uh, it, it's saying, hey, do you wanna install the PowerShell? Do you wanna install the Cloud Shell? How do you wanna do this? Gives you all these different options. You could go through this and then you just copy and paste in that uh, deal. Get out of that for a second. But you copy and paste in that script that we were just on, where were we? Oh, it, it backed me out of there. Let me go back to where I was. Copy and paste this script into that command shell, run it, and it will automatically build that out. And again, you know, it's like I said, it'll use resource group name. You're gonna put in your resource group name. You won't just paste it in like this. Um, you'll put in the name that you want. These are savable. So in other words, you can build this, save this script and use it again and again and again, or hand it out to your team. And you remember I was talking about the dev said, hey, I need a pre-configured server so I can run this particular process. You can go ahead and have these scripts teed up and ready to go so that you can have them execute the script and it meets all your compliancy, your regulatory uh, uh, tagging, everything else that you need all happens automatically. Okay, Bob, I'm gonna go slightly over. I apologize, I knew I was. I will talk, I'll deal with you later. 
Okay, <laughs> the beatings will occur. So I showed you already, you'll click there to run those PowerShell scripts. Um, and that's where you, you post that stuff into. And um, that's going to go ahead and, and get you in there. Okay, uh, policies and initiatives. So this is really the, the core of what we want to talk about. When you look at this, um, when we want to automate and govern, we want to look at management groups. We already did that. Set up your structure. Look at the cost management. Um, and so you're going to use all the reporting that I just showed you in the, the cost management screens with the tags to determine how you're spending. But under that, you want policies and blueprints. And policies and blueprints are really the real power uh, that's involved in this. Your policies, by the way, not only will they allow you to evoke policies and instances and everything else, but they'll also show you your compliancy states. So how well are you doing on any compliancy that you've set up to make sure that you are in compliance with your industry or, or whatever the case may be? I'll show you this in a second. Let me go back, actually. Um, we're going to go up here. I'm just going to go back to my main group and I want to go into policies to show you how this works. A policies are, um, first off, this shows me all my policies, shows me my compliance to those policies, show me any of my uh, current states that are in a non-compliance. So one of my three is currently out of compliance and you can dive in and click and figure out exactly which one of these is out of compliance. I can see them right here. So I know that this ASC default subscription on this one is non-compliant. And if I click, I can dive in deeper and get details and specifically see. Uh, I can look at my compliancy status in golf form, et cetera. What you're probably most interested, though, is creating your own policies. And to do that, we're going to go down under authoring and we're going to set up our definitions for our policies. So when I click on policies, you'll see or click on definitions, I have two options. One is a policy definition. One is an initiative definition. What's the difference? A policy is a single policy that I want to evoke onto uh, my environment. An initiative is a collection of policies that are applied. So let's say you're a healthcare organization. The initiative would be HIPAA compliance. And there are lots of rules applied to HIPAA compliancy that you have to follow in order to be HIPAA compliant. So the initiative is HIPAA compliance and it is made up of 20, 30 different policies individually that allow me to get that compliancy state, if that makes sense. So I can go into my policy definition here and you can build your own, you can use existing policies, you can do all kinds of stuff. So if I wanted to, I could just start building my own policy, create new categories, or best yet is I can go out to GitHub and there's a million different policies already out on GitHub, as you can imagine. So I can go in here and say, uh, inside of these different policy guides and stuff, I picked the wrong one. Let me go back out to my Azure policies, uh, built-in policies. If I click on built-in policy definitions and it says, what do you want? You want Lighthouse, you want network policies, you want compliancy policies. And then any one of these, I can go in and say, I want an approved virtual network audit. And I click and there's all the custom code that I need. So you don't have to go figure this out yourself. You don't have to write it yourself. It's already out there. There's thousands of these, just copy, paste, go back into your compliancy. So if I apply this, I would make a copy. I would jump back into my policy definition and I'd literally just paste it right in here. So I've already got a policy in here, but let's change this out. And I'm gonna paste that big long one that I just got. It's gonna tell me, it, it'll do, you know, it'll say, hey, there's a problem here. I don't recognize this character. Well, obviously that's a GitHub uh, tag there. So we'll take that out. But anyway, I can go through this, and once I got this all ready to go, I just go ahead and execute this, and I've automatically built the policy. So it's really easy to create new policies. Once I have a policy in place, I do the same thing for the initiative. The initiative, as I said, is HIPAA compliance. And now it says, okay, which of the policies do you want to add under this initiative? And so I just keep adding in all my policies until I get them plugged together to initiative. Once I get the initiative, I go back out to the, uh, whoops, I go back out to my uh, policy home and I will assign these out to the different segments. Assignments is where I take either an initiative or a policy and I assign it into a scope level of my Azure governance. 
I apologize if I'm moving too quick. I know I'm probably confusing some of you, but hopefully uh, the vast majority of you are getting this. I can, I can put these policies at any level of my object hierarchy that I want and, and make sure those rules apply. And so it makes things uh, really fast, really easy. Okay, let's get back real fast to our uh, deck here. Uh, I forgot where my deck is. I guess that's it. So we'll go here. Nope, I was way off that slide. So let me jump down. I apologize. I mixed uh, screens. Uh, we talked about resource tags. We talked about policies. There we go. Policies and initiatives is what I was in. So from there, we want to talk about blueprints. And again, remember, I have tons and tons of links and source code and everything else. But what a blueprint is, let me move this over and run this full screen for you. So what a blueprint is, is a blueprint takes your RBAC, your controls, your access controls, adds in your policies, mixes those with your ARM templates, the automation of building all this stuff, and puts it all together in one. And so what I can do is I can create a blueprint that adds together all these different features as one single um, solution, create it as a blueprint, and then publish it out into the subscriptions. Remember what I was talking about where your dev developer team needs a SQL server set up where they can run a test on, but they have to meet our compliance issues and they have to use only certain resources. And oh, by the way, if you don't put it in the right cloud group, you can actually charge more money. So I'm in South Central. If I use a, a, a cloud uh, a platform other than South Central, I put it over in Asia, it's gonna cost me a ton more money than if I had just put it inside of South Central. So since my headquarters is in South Central, I could create a policy that said, no one create a virtual machine outside of South Central. I could put definitions, RBAC on it, that says only Bob and I have access to it. And I could use an ARM template to go ahead and custom create that machine with the right number of cores and memory and everything else. All that gets added into a blueprint. And so when I go into Azure and I pull up the blueprints, this is what the blueprints look like. And I can create definitions for blueprints. So I'm gonna create a new blueprint. And it'll simply ask me via the wizards, what do you wanna do? As Microsoft always does, there's tons of existing blueprints that are already out there. And the reason this Australian government uh, is out here is someone was on our previous Azure session and happened to be from Australia and said, do they have one for the Australian government? And I said, I don't know. I typed it in and sure enough, they have an entire blueprint set up for any Azure governance agency uh, for Australia. And you can go in and you can look at all excuse me, I got the hiccups, the individual artifacts, you can customize it and tweak it. The point being though, is you don't have to build it all from scratch. You can use these pre-existing stuff, tie it all together, create these blueprints, and then I just publish them out. And so when my team needs a new resource, they click on the approved resource for building a SQL server or setting up a web farm or whatever they want to. And when they click, it all executes at once. It all meets my compliance. It all has the tagging. It all has the RBAC policies applied. And I don't have to do anything long-term. I don't have my developers waiting for my cloud group to get all that stuff built for them. It's a touch of a button and, you know, Five minutes later, they're up and running. So it's the fastest, easiest, coolest way to get this stuff done. Blueprints is the way to go. All right, Security Center, I'm not even going to show you because I'm two minutes over, uh, but it's exactly what you see here. Microsoft took the security stack and has tied it into the Azure portal. Azure now reports back up through the Microsoft 365 environment. So you can see your compute, networking, data, applications, all of this stuff rolls into your security. If you want full demos of this, I'd highly encourage you to come join our security stack webinar where I take an hour to show you how all this stuff integrates. My point here though, is I want you to realize that everything inside of Azure, data and apps and VMs and all this stuff, all report back up through the security stack and are visible through the security center. And so if I click here, I won't demo it, but I'll just show you it's there. So I can go in and if I look at my security overview, this will look through my entire system and tell me my compliancy, how am I doing, my subscriptions. I can go in depth and get tons and tons of data on different threat protection, different threat information, all done right inside this simple screen. So very, very cool. 
All right, we're right at the end here. I'm about to turn it back over to Bob to close this out, but I do want to talk about this. This is brand new. So Microsoft and the marketplace, all of our Microsoft customers worldwide have joined together to create what they call the CCO, Continuous Cloud Optimization. And what it is is basically it's hard to keep track and keep on top of all of the different Azure resources. And I told you, Microsoft's biggest competitor is Microsoft. They don't want you wasting money because if they waste your money, you're not going to use their resources. So Microsoft is working with all these customers to help build this thing out. And what it is, this is a Power BI dashboard. And I've got the link here. If you want to click on this, it'll take you right out to the portal site where all of this is, all the source code, everything else is here. And they'll teach you how to set this up. But there's three different dashboards you can do. There's an Azure infrastructure, an Azure governance dashboard, and an Azure uh, dashboard with AKS, so this Kubernetes service, basically. And it looks like this, basically. It's, it's a, a dashboard that will pull all of your Azure uh, resources through. It runs AI against it, and it'll tell you where you have tremendous waste inside your system where you have way too too much hard disk or too many cores or whatever. It'll help you right size your network to keep your cost as minimally low as possible. So this is a really cool initiative. This is something that uh, Techstar is really jumping into. We had a meeting this morning about uh, uh, building out some uh, portal demos portals for you guys so you can see this live and see how it really can save you a ton of money. Um, so I got the link for you in here, um, but these three dashboards are amazing. I'm gonna try to set these up for this Friday. I'm doing a Power BI class. Uh, and if you wanna know about that, Techstar Events is the place to go um, where you can hopefully see a live demo of that this Friday. And then I'm going to turn it back to Bob. He's going to talk real quickly about these offers and kind of wrap us up here. Yeah. So, yeah, very exciting. I think that's going to be just a great, uh, a great demo on Friday. Uh, so hopefully everyone can make that. Um, BI is a big piece of our business. Um, so showing clients how to execute on that as it relates to governance. Uh, that's that's really it's for me. That's uh, sort of geeky. That that excites me. So, um, so a little bit about Techstar. I want to. I just want to. I want to tout. You know, the individuals like Mike. You know, we believe in combining uh, trainers with with the industry technical experts, and we think that's the best way to educate our clients. Our best clients are those that take the time to be educated properly. Um, for those clients now that are on the call that are interested in engaging Techstar to help them adopt more Microsoft technology. Uh, very excited to announce that Microsoft is now funding efforts like that. So if, so if you said, hey, I'm thinking about you know, going into Azure in a big way, or perhaps I want to adopt governance to deploy Power BI or even Power Platform, how can we apply governance towards all that? Uh, that gets Microsoft's ears, right? Just like if you said, I want to consume more 365. So we go back to Microsoft uh, and we, on your behalf, we find your Microsoft rep, we work with them to gain the funding that very often funds, uh, if, if, if not some, all of our all of the costs to engage Techstar. Uh, so that funding has been available now for about a month or so, and um, and that we expect that to be available through the end of the year. But obviously, the sooner the better because it will it will fill up. Uh, so uh, please feel free to contact us about that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pop the survey in the window. Uh, whoops! It looks like I got something else in there. One second. And while you're doing that, I'm going to yeah. uh, real quickly just add to that. So we have a, a free four-hour assessment workshop. We'll come in, sit down with you, and we'll help you if you want us to, to help you kind of organize and set this stuff up. What, what uh, Bob was just talking about is um, if you want to actually engage and do a full-fledged uh, implementation, the rules that Microsoft have changed, this changed over July of this year. It used to be they worked with partners and Microsoft did a lot of funding. A lot of that's gone. Uh, however, uh, because Techstar is a great Microsoft partner and we're tied in and I was there for a long time and a lot of our, our Techstar employees have worked at Microsoft for significantly long times, uh, we have a great relationship. We have ways to access that funding. And Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to exaggerate, but we've got four of these we're working right now, three, yeah. four. 
for existing customers where Microsoft's uh, offered to help out. So yeah. um, talk to Bob, uh, talk to me. We'll be glad to, to work it through and help you. And we, if we can get funding for you, it's great because uh, Microsoft yeah. will help pay to, to make sure that you're implementing this stuff right. It's just like I said, right? They want you to do it correctly and not waste money because that'll keep you a long-term Azure right. customer for years and so, years and years. So just to paint, paint the high level picture, we have a discovery call with you and the team uh, so that we, we know what, how to create that workshop agenda. Uh, we, we all agree with the timing and the length and the, the, the deliverables, the achievements, uh, all of that. So um, so that's a, a typical workshop goes probably three to three hours to maybe a half day. Um, we actually have one coming up that is a full day. So a client said, hey, look, I want to teach the advanced features of Power BI. We sent them a syllabus. They loved it. We customized it a little bit. And that's a full day session. So it really depends on, on the level of education. Um, but uh, but folks like Mike can help you learn that and uh, and most importantly implement that type of technology. So I've popped the chat in the window. Um, I just see there's a question. Do we do have offices in Canada? I, that I don't know. Um, I know that we have resources all over. Mike, are you aware of any resources in Canada? We do not have offices in Canada, but we have customers in Canada. I've been right. to Montreal and Vancouver a couple of times. So yeah. So doing business in Canada is not foreign to us. And Toronto. Sorry. So yeah, you can feel free to um, uh, uh, contact us. Uh, you can even do it through the um, through the survey. There's a place in there to click contact me, and we'll make sure we follow up with you. Again, thanks for everyone's time today. I know we covered a lot, but uh, the, both the PowerPoint and the link to this video will be ma made available within about 24 hours, and we'll make sure we get that out to you. And we hope to see you at another webinar very soon. Thank you for for engaging with TechStar today. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.